heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Hi, Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we take a deep dive into the shock ouster of Sam Altman from OpenAI. What happened? What lies ahead for the AI startup as most of the company's staff threatened to depart? And a clear win for Microsoft. Shares of the tech giant rise as analysts see risks contained for the company's AI ambitions as Altman joins Microsoft to lead a new advanced AI research team. Plus, we'll speak to developers in the field of AI and the venture capitalists backing them this hour to discuss what the ecosystem looks like for these startups amid the upheaval at OpenAI. But first, Ed, look, you've got to shine a light on some of the publicly traded shares that are impacted by all of this. Right. I mean, this is the proxy of sentiment of what happened over the last 48 hours. Microsoft shares higher, flirting with a fresh record high, basically reversing the last minute drop they had Friday when news broke in the last 15 minutes of the session that OpenAI's board had fired Sam Altman. Analysts very positive on the developments, which are principally, as it stands, Sam Altman and Greg Brockman, who was chairman of the board of OpenAI, have joined Microsoft in order to lead this new AI research unit. We will get into that later in the show. What you can't see is what's playing out in private markets. And trust me, there is a lot playing out in private markets. Mm. We will get that detail later in the show. But as we speak, there are hundreds of open AI staff that are taking action. Let's break down the news with Bloomberg's Rachel Metz, who is joining me on set in San Francisco, having stayed up with me all weekend mm. to break this story. What do we know about what's happening inside open AI HQ? Right now, it sounds like the majority of the company's uh, employees have said that they will leave if their demands are not met. They are really upset about this ousting of Sam Altman um, and then the subsequent resignation of Greg Brockman. So the numbers, I think, are that 599 out of 770 staff. In other words, the vast majority of staff have signed this letter what, whose side are the staff on here? I mean, this is hard to understand, but we're talking about everyone other than those that have departed already. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, this, what I thought was really interesting when, when I saw this letter early this morning is that it makes it very, very clear whose side most of the employees are on. Like, I think before there was a sense that a lot of people were on Sam Altman's side, but it wasn't crystal clear. This is saying, hey, we, almost all of us, are very angry, so angry we're willing to leave our jobs at what has been the world's leading uh, independent AI company. Rachel, number 12 took my eye on the list of those who have signed this letter. It's Ilya, Ilya Sutskeva, who is on the board, who made the calls, we understand through all of your guys' reporting, made the calls to Sam Altman and Greg himself to basically let them know that they're no longer going to be at the company. Yeah, that's really a bit confusing, right? I mean, uh, at first I was like, hmm, but, you know, it's been a really long day that's lasted three days. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, I think there, he tweeted, I think it was this morning, um, it, that he made a mistake Right. And he I mean, it sounds I don't think he wants the company to explode. Um, Perhaps he didn't anticipate what the consequences would be of the actions he was taking. And no wonder we are getting so much views and theories being shared ultimately about corporate governance. We'll go into that much more later in the show, Rachel. But I'm interested in also ultimately who's being drafted in to replace it. How on earth does the new CEO of OpenAI try to ensure that we don't have this mass departure? That is an excellent question. Uh, So the person who was named very uh, late yesterday as the new CEO by the board, Emmett Shear, he was a co-founder of um, the video game streaming service Twitch, um, which has also, of course, been used for all kinds of streaming at this point. Um, Emmett uh, is a little bit, is more on the conservative side of technology development in the sense that he is in favor of slowing things down somewhat which is um, what uh, Ilya um, had been also pushing. So sort of, you know, aligned with the board members then and and with Ilya, um, 
he is going to probably have to do a lot of convincing to the staff if he wants to get them to stay with him in charge. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens over the next, I, I was about to say days, but let's say hours. Well, let's recap. It's only been 48 hours, essentially, maybe more since news broke that Sam Altman had been fired. This is the timeline of what happened. You and I and all of our colleagues spent most of the weekend with everyone else thinking, Sam's coming back. This is happening. Based on the reporting since, explain to us what actually happened and the chronology of events. So it, you mean, how far back do you want me to go here? Uh, gosh, <laughs> let's say we've start with Sam being fired on Friday. Okay, on Friday, um, we were told that Sam had been fired by the board, which I think came as a shock to probably pretty much anybody except for the board. Um, once that happened, it was a scramble to figure out, well, you know, what happened here? Uh, was Did something really bad happen? It sounded very mysterious. And n information started coming from OpenAI executives themselves um, in the form of memos they were sending internally that the board has not told us of any malfeasance, for instance, which I think was the word used in a memo that Brad Lightcap sent out to CEO. staff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, COO, thank you. Um, so then it started to sound like uh, Mira Marathi, who was named interim CEO, she had been the chief technology officer and, and increasingly a um, prominent figure at the company alongside Sam. Uh, it sounded like perhaps she was going to rehire Sam Altman and Greg Brockman, who um, had been also at the company and quit after Sam was ousted. Um, then in a last minute twist, it sounded like Emmett Shear was hired and now everybody has signed this letter, or not everybody, but most people have signed this letter saying, uh, we're going to join this company that Microsoft is now creating that Sam and Greg are going to run. So if, if you, you know, if you don't bring them back, essentially. So I don't know about you guys, yeah. but I keep just kind of turning left and right. I'm not really sure what's going to happen next year. Whiplash and a whole yes. lot of discussion on what is meant to be a holiday week. Rachel Metz, we thank you so much for making time for us when I know you've just been at the grindstone with your reporting. We thank you so much. And look, we just finished where, well, Rachel was discussing where next for Microsoft as it sets up this new AI focus point. What is the impact on the publicly traded company? What of Satya Nadella and really his ability to turn this story around in the final few hours. Joining us is Jeffrey, senior internet analyst, Brent Thill. Brent, you've got a rating on Microsoft, $400 price target. Is this a positive as it stands? As it stands, it's, it's a win-win for Microsoft. I mean, they get the number one up-and-coming up and individual in tech uh, leading the AI journey. Uh, and then secondarily, they've been talking about this uh, for a long time. How do they reduce their independence on one vendor like OpenAI and spread their AI bats across open source, across their own languages, across other languages. And uh, we think that uh, Altman can, can probably steer that chip in a, in a really good way uh, from, from internally at Microsoft, obviously from a hiring perspective. If you've got over 500 people signing a petition that feel this strongly, I've never seen this in, in my, my coverage of tech in 20 years, where literally 500 people sign a letter internally, you've never seen this in tech ever. So if they yeah. feel that strongly about him and he says, hey, would you like to come over here to Microsoft? Like, what's the talent pool at Microsoft going to look like, you know, two months from now? It's going to be insane. Well, Brent, the, the question that I hear out in the market is, will Microsoft buy out the rest of OpenAI? Can Microsoft buy out the rest of OpenAI? I don't know if they can. They obviously have an $11 billion plus stake. So they care for the future. They want to ensure this happens. My view is actually OpenAI will get uh, effectively that board settled down. It will get the employees settled down and hopefully keep everyone in, in place. Uh, and I don't know their in incentive structure, but I'm not sure that I'd want to lose all my incentive comp and stock options in OpenAI just because I'm upset the CEO left. I, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. So my sense is... This ship will be calmed at OpenAI. Uh, Microsoft, uh, with via Nadella, he's the best negotiator in tech. He'll figure out a way to ensure that uh, that they, they keep this intact, keep their investment mm -hmm. preserved, but also have uh, the best of having you know Sam and team there. Uh, so I, I, I look at, uh, I, I think there's going to be a, a better outcome, hopefully, for OpenAI and their employees where they can they can get some additional board members in and get them calmed down. I, I, I understand why they're as upset. But again, I, I, I can't recall a story in 20 years where that many people signed a petition would walk walk out. I, I, I think that 
you're going to end up seeing a situation where there's a, a middle ground that's met and that hopefully both camps survive peacefully and we move on and uh, we can all enjoy our Thanksgiving week. Do you think Microsoft remains the key player in AI? Therefore, can they remain at basically still having the distance between themselves and ultimately the viewpoint that Alphabet's behind, for example? Microsoft's crushing it. I was up at the Microsoft Developer Conference in Seattle last week, and you, you can barely get in to see some of these demos. The pace of innovation is like nothing I've seen covering tech for 20 years. You talk to product managers that are not spokespeople for Microsoft and talk about the pace of the innovation. I mean, we're talking about months of when they said it was go time to launch in a product. Now, the product isn't perfect. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be the, the smoothest ride out of the gate. But the, the level of innovation is beyond anything we have seen in any, any time I've spent covering Microsoft, even as a developer of Microsoft in the 90s. This pace of innovation is off the charts. They are so far ahead of everyone else. And we do believe that uh, you know, Amazon is, is gonna, gonna also be in the, the mix. So our thesis is Amazon and Microsoft win the enterprise, Google wins the consumer market. They're very different markets, but all three will have a, a seat at the table. All right, Jeffrey, Senior Internet Analyst, Brent Till, on the Microsoft side of this story. Coming up on the program, we will continue the conversation on Sam Altman, on OpenAI, as hundreds of employees threaten to leave the company if the board doesn't reside. The VC, the AI reaction is next. This is Bloomberg Technology. To recap our top story, in a letter to the OpenAI board from hundreds of employees, the vast majority of those left at OpenAI are saying they will resign from the company and join the newly announced Microsoft subsidiary led by Sam Altman and Greg Brockman if the board of OpenAI does not resign. Lots of implications. Joining us now is someone that knows OpenAI very well, uh, worked with that company, now leads his own startup, Octane. Let's bring in Matt Schlicht, Octane AI CEO. Um, first off, what have you heard from OpenAI? You are essentially a developer that relies on the underlying technology. You're trying to build using the underlying technology. Have you had any update from OpenAI? Yeah, so Octane AI, we've been around since 2016. We now are built on top of OpenAI's GPT-4. We help uh, entrepreneurs run AI automations. We've help them generate over half a billion dollars. And a lot of that is because of what OpenAI has provided us. So this weekend has been really tumultuous. Uh, I'm a big believer in Sam. The community is a big believer in Sam. I know him from back when I was in Y Combinator in 2012. Uh, but OpenAI, we just had Dev Day. I was there. It was the peak of their technology. Excitement was off the charts. It went really, really well. Now there's a little bit of mistrust, a lot of mistrust on what's going to happen. I am hearing from OpenAI uh, that they are expressing support for developers. They're going to make sure the API stay up. The technology is not going to go down. But this weekend has been uh, a lot for anyone in the AI ecosystem. Matt, let's let's stay with with your relationship with Sam and, and the company for a minute. You you know lots of people that work there. You are friends with people who rely on the ecosystem as well. In your mind, is there a path forward where Sam comes back to OpenAI? Or, or are we looking at a new look OpenAI and trying to understand how you work with them and how others work with this new look OpenAI? It's, it's really unclear. I think over the weekend, we thought Sam was going to come back. Now that Satya has you know, announced that he's over at Microsoft, uh, Satya also, you know, obviously has to make sure that the Microsoft stock is performing well. I don't know if he can flip back on that. So it's a really sticky uh, situation. It's, it's unclear. I, I have no idea what's going on. I don't think that OpenAI employees know what's going on. Matt, much of this is about a concern of the pace of innovation. Have you ever had any concern or indeed the ability for OpenAI to live up to the amount of demand that we were seeing as well? OpenAI has created something that literally is magic. They're on the forefront of AI. They're the soul of, no matter what anybody wants to say, they're the soul of the AI community and the movement right now. In terms of 
you know, have I thought about is AI going to go too fast or is it going to go too slow? I think that this disruption is definitely causing it to go slower, and I would like it to go faster as well as a lot of people in the AI community. We rely on this technology. It's it's allowing you to put human-like intelligence inside of your code, which means that the program can write content, it can talk like a human, and it can make reasoning decisions like a human. It can be autonomous, and it's just getting better at a breakneck speed. So this disruption with OpenAI for myself and for anyone building on top of this technology means that it, it's, is it going to go slower? Is it going to be pulled back? What's going to happen next? Um, it's, this is not an ideal situation by, by any means. What do you think it means in terms of your desire to work with a newly formed unit within Microsoft or indeed with other competitors, Matt? I think that OpenAI was seen as someone that you couldn't beat. It was too big to beat. And one of the interesting things that is happening uh, because of this weekend, because of all of this chaos, is now, no matter what happens, let's say they bring back Sam, everyone, everybody stays, OpenAI is not infallible. They are someone you can beat now. And that actually opens up a tremendous amount of opportunities for new people, whether they're ex-employees of OpenAI or other entrepreneurs, to go start companies that compete with OpenAI. And I think that that's going to happen. This leaves a huge opening for that. In the event that a lot of people leave OpenAI, maybe a bunch join Microsoft and go join Sam and Craig, a lot of other ones are going to start companies. And I think more capital than ever is going to flow into AI. Mm -hmm. You know, just this year, I started a venture capital firm called Theory Forge Ventures with Ben Park to do just that. And this is a sad situation with OpenAI. It makes me sad. But at the same time, yeah. investors are going to be clamoring in. Matt Schlecht, Octane AI CEO and indeed a venture capitalist. We thank you so much. Coming up, so much more on the OpenAI drama. With exactly that, another conversation on the venture space, on the investment. We have Conviction founder Sarah Gao. And that's next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Turning back to where we left off with our open AI conversation, the drama, the impact on the AI landscape more broadly. Sarah Gao, founder of Conviction, it's a venture firm, purpose built to serve AI native companies. And well, we were just talking to Matt Schlicht, who thinks that more innovation, more startups are going to come of this. Sarah, do you abide by that silver lining to what feels like a cloud right now? Uh, I, I mean, I would start by saying I have such enormous respect for the work Sam and Greg and Ilya and the entire OpenAI team have done over the years, right? So before we talk about silver lining, I think we should talk about the um, contribution they've had in terms of igniting a technology mm. revolution. It's just very sad to see it happen. And sincere respect to Ilya for, you know, um, a public apology for something he regrets, whatever the outcome, this is his life's work. And he has made a tremendous contribution to the advancement of AI. And uh, many of the startups that we back and partner with OpenAI in, like um, Harvey, which is legal AI, and a portfolio company for OpenAI, we benefit from all of that innovation. Uh, I, I think that being said, the ecosystem, the landscape is much more open than it was a week ago, which is wild to say. OpenAI is both revered and feared, and in its current state, it is much diminished. Sarah, delighted to have you on the show. You, you know everyone. You know the players. Um, you yourself are not invested in open AI, but the, the ecosystem you are so closely connected to. Uh, just tell me your reaction, frankly, your, your, how you felt this weekend watching that unfold. Yeah, I mean, I started with um, sort of respect and sadness for friends who work at open AI. Um, I think my secondary reaction is really just as champion level business people, you have to hand it to Satya and Kevin in managing all of this. The multiple on Microsoft stocks since Satya took it over in 2014 is up 10x from what was already one of the largest five companies in the world. So um, I uh, am in, I'm just floored by their ability to navigate the situation. It's incredibly hard to be this aggressive and strategic and steering so large a ship. Um, and anticipating the tidal wave and coming out so far ahead. So all roads from here are paved with gold for Microsoft. 
I think going back to the first question, like we are an AI focused early stage investing firm, right? And so a part of it is a recognition that there are opportunities at every layer, which we continue to believe, um, but now even more so for the independent foundation model labs, such as Mistral and Inflection and Anthropic. And I, I, think there, um, I think there's increasing interest in open source from yes. corporations and developers just in, in having more control over their own models and running them on their on their own infrastructure and inference platforms like Base10. And so there will be continued capital for startups making these bets from investors like in Conviction. And of course, for full stack and application level companies as well. You, you, you've invested in, in startups building their own large language models. You've interviewed on your podcast leaders at some of the firms with making bigger models with much many more billions of parameters. Does this weekend make it a more competitive marketplace for building generative AI technology? Uh, I, I think companies are, so, so there's sort of two dimensions, right? There's like what it takes to compete and um, of course, like the reaction from the ecosystem of customers and developers. Uh, this set of events, of course, gives all of OpenAI's customers and developers pause. Mm -hmm. um, they're making long-term bets and they want to understand the incentives and staying power of their partners. Uh, in my experience, startup founders are sometimes reluctant to ask for the early check or seem too profit-seeking or capitalist to their customers. But I think transparency is key. That's a lesson from this weekend. I've heard so many customers ask startups, how are you planning to make money? Or even ask me as an investor in these startups, is the business viable? I am willing to pay, but I don't want to make the wrong bet. Yeah. Will they make it? And the, the nonprofit board here is explicitly prioritizing other goals they have above customers and developers. And so I think that, um, I think that does change the ecosystem. Mm. Uh, in, in terms of other opportunities, like we should not trivialize the work that OpenAI done, has done over the years, right? Creating foundation models is a huge effort. And so from an infrastructure um, uh, data partnerships, tooling and uh, talent perspective, I, I think, um, you know, the, the ship of thesis, it's a thought experiment. Like if you rebuild a ship entirely with new parts, is it the same ship? It's a, it's a question of identity and it's often applied to um, human consciousness and sci-fi, but it applies to organizations too. Right. If OpenAI uh, has the weights and then all of the advantages that we were just talking about, they're huge, but an organization yes. is also a Sarah, culture. And, yeah. Yeah, Conviction founder Sarah Grau, it's just great to have you on the show and get that perspective. Thank you. This is Bloomberg. Some breaking news for you right now. The United States, the Justice Department to be exact, is seeking more than $4 billion from Binance, that of course being the cryptocurrency exchange, to end a criminal case. It's a years-long investigation. Negotiations between the DOJ and Binance include, in fact, the possibility that its founder, CZ, would face criminal charges in the United States under an agreement to resolve the probe into alleged money laundering, bank fraud and sanctions violations. That's some update on crypto. But Ed, back to our key number one story. OK, all change at OpenAI. And my goodness, how quickly things do change. Earlier this year, Bloomberg's Emily Chang caught up with now former OpenAI CEO Sam Altman to talk about his relationship with Microsoft. Listen to this. How would you describe your relationship with Satya Nadella, how much control they have? You know, I've heard people say, you know, Microsoft's just going to buy OpenAI. You're just making big tech bigger. Um, company's not for sale. Like, I don't know how to be more clear than that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a great relationship with them. I think it's a, that these like big major partnerships between tech companies usually don't work. This is an example of it working really well. Okay, fast forward to present day. This is the latest. After a game of musical chairs, Microsoft announces that Altman and his co-founder Greg Brockman will join the company, will join Microsoft this announcement on literally on the heels of a frenetic weekend in Sil Silicon Valley, Valley following the aftermath of Altman's firing on Friday. Microsoft shares continuing to push higher in the session up 1.9%. Bloomberg's Dina Bass is our Microsoft correspondent and alongside the rest of us has been all over this story all weekend. Um, 
let's first talk about this new unit within Microsoft. Satya announces it late, late, late last night. What do we know? Game of, you know, musical chairs and game of, or Game of Thrones. Uh, so <laughs> what we... What we know is, you know, Microsoft, uh, Satya spent the weekend trying to figure out a way with other investors to get Sam and Greg reinstated to the company. As of, uh, you know, late Sunday night, there were conversations uh, with uh, Mira Marazzi, the interim CEO, trying to do exactly that. Those with board members, uh, her conversations, those conversations failed. And so uh, Nadella had to go to plan B, which was, okay. We'll just hire Sam and Greg ourselves because the, the concern that Microsoft had was, you know, when there's all this upheaval at OpenAI, you start seeing everybody threatening to jump ship, and you saw that massive outpouring of support Saturday night for Sam. That it very much imperils not just Microsoft's thirteen billion dollar investment in OpenAI, but Microsoft's entire strategy. Satya has revamped the entire company's product line around artificial intelligence, and that artificial intelligence depends on OpenAI. Mm. If OpenAI ceases to exist in the way that Microsoft had expected, that is an enormous problem for Microsoft. But for now, the deal brokering seems to be in its advantage. And Evercore ISI saying that the hiring is a clear win for Microsoft. It's basically an aqua hire. What are some of the difficulties around doing this culturally and indeed potentially even regulatory in the longer term? Sure. We don't know what the if regulators will look at this. Uh, it, I, I heard the discussion and Emily's question of, well, why not just have Microsoft buy them? At Microsoft, both because of the complicated nonprofit, for profit structure of open AI and for regulatory reasons, I really could not have just outright bought open AI, at most experts think. Um, what are the problems? Well, Microsoft has its own artificial intelligence effort. It's been working on in that area for more than two decades. And there has been some tension over the last couple of years around the way in which Microsoft and Nadella chose to really prioritize, both in terms of resources and focus, the work of OpenAI over some of Microsoft's internal projects. Some mm. of the people most concerned about that perhaps have left Microsoft, but they're still AI researchers there. So there's some question of how you integrate those things without uh, making, you know, a, a, a real sort of, uh, you know, issue for the people that are already there. Then there's just, you know, there are more mundane details. How many open AI people is Microsoft really going to hire? How do they decide to, you know, how do they compensate that? How do people already at Microsoft who had a salary freeze this year feel, feel about that compensation? All sorts of cultural issues. That said, People who say people from outside Microsoft cannot do well at Microsoft, I think are potentially thinking about a Microsoft of 10 years ago. Satya has acquired companies like LinkedIn, like GitHub, let them run on their own and had them function quite effectively within Microsoft. He's also hired executives. Yeah. And here I think of CTO Kevin Scott, who leads the AI effort, you know, executives from outside who have become very senior and very important uh, to Microsoft in a way that perhaps was not easy for outsiders to do in the office. Many noting the title of Sam Altman being that of a CEO internally. Dina Basby, thank you so much for all the iterations for that publicly side of the company. And let's just talk about what's left at OpenAI for a moment, because late Sunday, Emmett Shear was appointed interim CEO of OpenAI after the board quietly vetted candidates starting on Saturday night. Now, here's what we know about the appointment. Sources tell Bloomberg that Shear was seen as someone that can lead a large engineering group, but also as someone who recognizes an existential threat from AI. Like some members of OpenAI's board, Shia has ties to the so-called effective altruism movement. Shia has stepped down as CEO of Amazon's game streaming site Twitch earlier in the year, and in May, he actually joined Y Combinator as a visiting partner. Let's get a conversation going with Zachary Lipton. He is the chief technologist and scientific officer over at Abridge. It's a company using generative AI for automatic drafting of after-visit clinical notes. You're also an assistant professor of machine learning at Carnegie Mellon University. Zachary, the fact that you really focus on understanding the social impacts of machine learning in a philosophically coherent way is the way it says on your website. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of what the tension was here ultimately on OpenAI? Philosophical at that? Um, I think it's important to draw a big distinction. Um, there's a contingent of this community uh, that is more focused on the idea of AI as a potential existential risk to humanity. And there's a bunch of us who are more a group of um, 
social scientists, um, ethicists, um, some, some maybe socially inclined computer scientists who've looked at these problems from different angles, more focused on the near-term terrestrial uh, actual harms of AI systems as operationalized in businesses today. So there's this... Um, uh, a, a lot of work that I think very few people disagree is like serious or, or real problems and important today about um, understanding how we think about privacy, accountability, transparency, where liability goes once you have um, a greater degree of automation in our decision making systems. But on the other side, there's a group of people who are more focused on something uh, what they call X risk or this idea that AI is careening towards, you know, by mechanisms known or unknown, that there's this marching progress towards, towards something that is a different kind of threat that needs to be regarded as more of like an epoch changing uh, uh, event, something more analogous to nuclear weapons. And I'd say that, like, my work sits a little bit more in what they might call near-termism. And, and, and the, this, this group of effective altruists, their philosophical position is that they are, they think that however small the threat, if, it's, if, if, if the risk, if they're wrong, is, is, a, is a wiping out of humanity, that this is the most important priority in the world. And I'd say it's a relatively fringe belief among technologists, among business people, um, but it does have some very well-heeled backers, and it does have quite a bit of um, a foothold in San Francisco, right. um, and in particular, in, in particular research labs. And OpenAI does have some amount of influence of this um, existentialist thinking. Right, Zachary, whether whether the existential threat uh, is a fringe idea or not, what is I think we can agree on the events of the last weekend being monumental, I guess, within your career, both in academia and building generative AI tools. Just reflect quickly on what you made of the last 48 to 72 hours. Oh, well, it, 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 it's, it's quite wild, given that when, when I entered the field 10 years ago, I had to explain to my parents what machine learning and AI were, and they were just glad that I wasn't you know, trying to make a living playing the saxophone anymore. So uh, <laughs> to go from there to it's the front page of the New York Times that uh, there's a, a kerfuffle at uh, an AI startup is pretty wild. Um, you know, I think in general, we're, we're watching before our eyes the maturation of an industry. And uh, a lot of how we got here, and I think you see this all over the economy. I think we saw this with the dot-com bubble and um, the, uh, some amount of discord and some amount of insanity uh, as uh, we went from a sort of first-generation set of companies with strange governance structures and uh, uh, you know, a certain kind of velocity to, to a, a more mature uh, environment that followed. You know, it didn't spell the doom of the Internet, but it certainly was like a growing up period. I think what we're watching before our eyes is is uh, us moving from a period of this being brand new technology and um, people behaving in strange ways that are sort of exceptional by any normal standards to uh, a period that's going to follow, which is going to be more robust. Right. It's going to involve people depending on a much wider and more stable ecosystem of services provided by a larger set of companies. Uh, and remind our audience that almost 600 people representing the intellectual capital within OpenAI are currently threatening to leave and go to Microsoft. So Zachary Lipton, a bridge CDO, and Carnegie Mellon, assistant professor of machine learning, breaking it down. What a weekend it has been. Thank you. All right, we had that breaking news that we had earlier on Binance. Bloomberg, Shanali Basak running to set. What do we know, Shanali? We know a few things. We know that there, there's not clarity around the structure of the deal here, but it could cost as much as $4 billion. Now, this is a years-long probe by the Justice Department into Binance to look at alleged money laundering, bank fraud, sanctions violations, and this would create an end to that saga for Binance versus the Justice Department. Now, we also know, according to Bloomberg's reporting, that Binance has sought to minimize its penalties and has even sought a deferred prosecution agreement that would put an even further end uh, to uh, prosecution so long as Binance meets certain thresholds, uh, usually a penalty and a detailed statement of facts outlining what exactly had happened here. So this could come as soon as the end of the month. We don't know the total terms of the deal itself, but again, it could be as much as $4 billion sought from Binance to end this case, and it would certainly be one of the largest penalties tied to uh, crypto uh, matter in the United States, let alone worldwide.
Shanali Basak with the breaking news. We thank you so much on all things crypto. Now, look at some other news that we're following for you. Ex CEO Linda Yaccarino has acknowledged that some advertisers are taking a break, a pause from the platform. Now, this pause follows some outrage over anti Semitic content and commentary on X, some of it, in fact, seemingly endorsed by the site's owner, Elon Musk. Now, in a memo to staff on Sunday, Yaccarino blamed, quote, a misleading and manipulated article for this pause in spending, referencing, in fact, a Media Matters piece that said ads from big brands were being placed near offensive content. Ed. All right, coming up on Bloomberg Technology, Tusk Ventures CEO Bradley Tusk joins us. We go back to OpenAI, the drama and its impact on the AI space. We have to ask questions about corporate governance. That's coming up next. Also looking at shares of General Motors, pairing some of their gain in the session up 1.8%. The news curiously timed late Sunday night. Kyle Vogt resigned as the CEO of Cruise, General Motors' autonomous driving unit. GM shuffling the deck, putting a lot of long-standing GM execs to run that unit. But goodness knows what happens next. This is Bloomberg Technology. We return to the drama consuming OpenAI and how it could impact the startup space more broadly. After OpenAI CEO Sim Altman was ousted by the company's board on Friday, prompting a campaign from investors and staff to bring him back, well, now Microsoft has hired Sam Altman, while former Twitch leader Emmett Shear is taking over as OpenAI's interim chief executive. For today's VC Spotlight, let's bring in Bradley Tusk for his read on all of this. He is the CEO of Tusk Ventures and also the author of the upcoming book, Obvious in Hindsight, satirical behind the scenes look at how technology and politics sort of intertwine the ways in which decisions are actually being made by those in power. Is all of this obvious in hindsight when you look at the corporate governance yes. structure? Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, this was an insane structure. Um, and this one's kind of unique in that it both you had such a big underlying company that is for profit with this nonprofit board on top of it. But I think it really raises questions about B Corps and I think about ESG to a certain extent. And you know there are fiduciary duties and there are incentives that need to be aligned. Mm. I think when you have boards that clearly have sort of other incentives and other ideas and that aren't about the shareholders and aren't about the employees and aren't about the customers, um, you can create a lot of problems, which is what just happened. Let's just go through ultimately what this board, how it differs from others. It's made yeah. up of, I think, only about four people yep. now because of a they few fired people have been here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Greg had been fired. Sam Altman had been fired. But others yeah. like Reid Hoffman had left over the course of the last year or so. Yeah. And ultimately, this is a not-for-profit board where the whole thesis was that it was the mission over profits. Right. Now, is that replicated anywhere else? And is this something that ultimately ventures should be learning from? Yeah, so I haven't seen this specific structure anywhere else, and I can't imagine we ever will again after the debacle that this all was. Um, but, but even when you get past that, you know, B Corps, which are kind of hybrid versions of what we're talking about, where they're public corporations and they're for profit, but they're meant to be doing social good, at least I think you know VCs should be taking a hard look at the bylaws um, of the boards of B Corps because then, by the way, I'm, I've got one or two in my portfolio and I'm, we're taking a look at it right now because I don't want a situation where the board has a moral stance or uh, an ideological stance and that really comes at the best interest of the company itself. Um, of course, there's always room on every board to talk about morality and ideology and everything else, but at the end of the day, you have a fiduciary duty to the shareholders um, or to the investors or whoever it is, and that's what's got to be met. And so, um, while I'm sure most B Corps are, are okay, it seems to me that the potential for what we saw does exist. And what we're talking about companies like Allbirds and Warby Parker and Ben and & Jerry's. And we're not just talking about kind of no-name companies here. So I, I know that I'm concerned, and I think other VCs should be looking at it too. Uh, Bradley, I want to bring an update to our audience. In the private markets, I think this is important. Joshua Kushner, who's the founder of Thrive Capital, has posted on X, every problem has a solution. In the background, there is a tender offer worth hundreds of millions of dollars that is in question here running this month where op uh, OpenAI employees were due to sell shares with Thrive Capital leading that round. I know you're not an investor in OpenAI, but is there any world in which that tender goes ahead? 
Yeah, I mean, I think to a certain extent it has to because you have all of these employees who are probably not making that much money in terms of salary because that's what happens when you work at a tech startup. And the promise is the pay, you know, the, the rainbow, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And a, a tender offer offers liquidity for people who have been counting on it and relying on it. And you have employees who want to move homes or pay for their kids' school or whatever it is. And so I think, you know, who, who, it's, whether it's Emmett Shearer or whoever's running that company, um, you have a responsibility because you're going to have a really unhappy workforce. You already have a workforce where over 100 people signed a letter threatening to quit. Um, and I think this would just exacerbate the problems. The question is, at what valuations? They were talking about an $80 billion valuation on the secondary market for the tender offer. Um, I think that if they can kind of get the ship righted and, and just wait a few weeks, it probably goes back to normal. Um, but if it continues to be chaos, then obviously investors are not going to pay up at that amount, and the shareholders and the employees are going to lose value. Tusk Ventures founder and CEO Bradley Tusk, great to have you here on Bloomberg Technology. Thank, Thank you. Now, coming up, more coverage on the ongoing drama between Sam Altman, OpenAI, and Microsoft. We will bring you what happened this weekend, the inside scoop from the best of Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. Okay, let's wrap up our coverage of Sam Altman's exit from OpenAI with the Bloomberg Big Take. We're joined by Bloomberg's Max Chafkin, who penned that monumental Business Week piece, but also Bloomberg's Ashley Vance. We have been in the trenches together for three days, uncovering everything that happened from about lunchtime Friday onwards. Uh, Ashley, I'll start with you. Just reflect on everything that we've learned, but also this kind of side scoop we had that Sam Altman was out there trying to raise tens of billions of dollars for a completely different chip company. What's that about? Yeah, I mean, there's just so much going on here. Sam is a very ambitious guy, so he, he's out trying to make this new artificial intelligence chip that would compete against NVIDIA, which, which OpenAI is buying a ton of NVIDIA chips. And, and, you know, just another indication of all these other things going on on top of open AI that I think some of the board was concerned about. And it sort of links towards the headline of your big take, the doomed mission behind Sam Altman's shock ouster from open AI. A doomed ouster, but also perhaps a doomed set of aligned or misaligned focuses coming from people who lead open AI. Yeah, I mean, you had this nonprofit board where a lot of people were really con uh, concerned about these apocalyptic AI scenarios. And you had Sam Altman and kind of his allies who were sort of using the promise of a or the potential of an apocalypse apocalypse to sell this new technology mm. and those two things collided right I, I think Sam Altman saw that as kind of a great way to market open AI but you had people who actually believed it and then who were getting increasingly worried over the past few weeks yeah right uh, Ashley let's be honest you and I had heard pretty early in the day Sunday that the board was digging in that there would be a new CEO no one believed it and now you have Ilya out with a tweet apologizing just your final thoughts well, yeah, Ilya's doing, you know, coup inception, a coup upon a coup. I, I don't think this is over. It sounds like <laughs> all these camps are still fighting to bring OpenAI back. As of right now, 700 of the 770 employees have vowed to, to leave the company if Sam and Greg aren't brought back. And so I don't think this is done. We've still got another day or two of this. Yeah, I just want to hear from Max the weirdest line you heard this week. <laughs> I mean, the idea of a counter coup that is taking place while the same coup is taking is going on is it's just like Ashley says, it's it's too crazy. And, and we're talking about, remember, this is like the most important part of one of the world's largest companies. You know, Microsoft is totally dependent on this relationship with OpenAI. So so seeing all of this chaos unfold around something that's so critical, that so much money, many billions of dollars are baked into is just something. Max Shafkin, it was something that you wrote. Ashley Vance, it was something that you broke. It was an extraordinary Herculean effort from all three of you. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Ed, I mean, we didn't even get to talk about the DoorDashes being done over the weekend. They went for DoorDash for food to OpenAI HQ. There is so much to recap from a crazy weekend on OpenAI. So we have a podcast. Check it out wherever you get your podcast, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and on all the Bloombergs. From SF and New York, this is Bloomberg. Thank you.